the God you think you know. One of the things I'm trying to do over the series is to take the projections we put upon God and change the way we think about them. So that we start to receive revelation of what He is actually really like from His perspective. So that we can change the way we think about Him based on His self-revelation. Because the reality is you can only know really about God what He tells you. Everything else you've made up. And so I've covered different aspects around his omniscience, his omnipotence. But tonight, I'm changing tack a bit. The God who expresses himself. And because in the morning, I'm doing a series called We Are the Image Bearers of God, I want to suggest to you at the outset that in the same way that God expresses himself fully, he wants us to be able to express ourselves. Now that carries two implications. Number one, you have to be able to receive his expressions towards you. But number two, you have to be able to give expressions. You have to be able to feel like God feels. But the way life does, it affects us in such a way that like a tortoise, we pull back into our shells when we've been hurt, when we've been affected negatively. And God wants us to be liberated in our expression as Christians. You go to some churches, you have to wear a hat on your head if you're a woman. Right? Some, people, some churches, you have to wear suits. Some churches, it's very austere. Nothing special allowed. Because you're only supposed to focus on the glory of God. As a matter of fact, in those same churches, nothing beyond the oral, the, the, the organ is allowed. Guitars of the devil. I'm convinced, though, that the harp that David played was not acoustic. <laughs> Seriously, I reckon that thing is plugged into an amp in heaven. And I, honestly, I reckon when David hits that harp, I promise you, it's not plunk, plunk, plunk. It's Led Zeppelin's no quarter. It's, there's noise happening in heaven. I mean, Psalm 148 goes like this. First three words, praise the Lord. Now, what does that look like? I know what it looks like for some of you. And the really, really charismatic among us. Yeah? When Melody's at church and she pulls out that ribbon of hers, like Hensia used to do, and dances on stage, I wonder how many people are thinking, what a scandal. When in Israel, it was absolutely normal for the musicians, the praises, and the dancers to stand in front in their hundreds in their hundreds to worship the Lord. My only condition with not letting you up here is if you like gross. <laughs> no, because you pull away from the worship of God. You don't add to it. There was a lady once who came to me in the front. I'm standing in the front. She said to me, can I just play a song on the piano? So I looked at her. I said, can you play the piano? She said, no. <laughs> this is a true story. So I said to her, so how are you going to play the piano? She says, I feel that when God gets me up here and I put my hand on the keyboard, God's going to anoint me to play. I said, uh-uh, son, you go sit down again. You're not getting a chance here. I'll, I'll, I'll take that in heaven if I was wrong, rather to spare you. I've had some people ask me if they can sing a song over us. Their voices are horrible. It's not going to happen. I'm sorry, maybe I've got no faith. Maybe I've got a sufficient faith. But wherever you are and wherever you're standing and wherever you're sitting where you are, you can praise the Lord. 
Have you ever seen those? Have you ever seen uh, how exuberantly soccer players, in particular, express themselves when they score a goal? Now, my young two, I mean, I can see David's listening to my preach over there, my oldest son. My other two, I think, are in that room over there. When they score a goal, what's that move? They've got the special thing they do with each other. I've never seen them do it in church, but they'll do it out on a soccer field when they've scored. Neymar, the biggest actor of them all. Surely you've seen what happens. Never mind scoring a goal, just getting touched. The wind passes him, someone going by, and Neymar's on the ground needing cardiac arrest surgery. Have you seen the overboard behavior of sports fans when their teams do extraordinary well? Have you ever seen the Bulls fans when the Bulls win a game? There's blue jerseys here on a Sunday. All of a sudden, they come out and blow this thing out, put it on. And yet the Bible says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights above. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His heavenly hosts. Can you imagine what it sounds like when the angels get going? When angels have the power literally to shake, if you read the book of Revelation, they will shake the earth physically through their power. And the scriptures command them to praise the Lord in heaven. I worry about people who go to austere churches who stand like this and sing. And the moment someone's loud or the music's loud, you know, this is just wrong. How are they going to cope? How are they going to survive? Never mind aeons, the first three seconds in heaven. When there are four-headed beasts and cherubim and seraphim and angels numbering 10,000 times 10,000 who are exuberant in their worship of the true God who deserves it all. I'm trying to tell you that God loves expression. And I'm trying to say that some of us need to learn again how to be a little bit expressive toward God. And toward each other. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, you shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heavens. You waters above the skies. That's not the clouds, obviously. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For at His command they were created. And it carries on and on and on and on. And the thing is, God wants us to praise. But it's interesting to me how many people actually aren't in touch with their emotions. And I'm not just talking about husbands. Because I want to say those girls, you've just got to learn to be a bit more discerning, all right? When you come home to us after a hard day's work and you ask us, how are we? And we say, fine, there's a lot in there. <laughs> <laughs> just, just dig deep. All right, when we say we're fine, it's because we are. You must like go, that's great. But it's true that some people either just aren't in touch with their emotions, or on the other hand, they're people whose emotions rule them. They're just not normal. They wake up every day and you don't know what you're getting. Hey? Huh? They're just freaks. You know? Some people, you go look outside first, or just before she wakes up, he or he, before he wakes up. <laughs> just go outside. I want to, is it a full moon? I need to know what to look at. You know what I'm saying. There are people who suppress their emotions out of habit because they can't cope. But I want to say, many of us, we've lost the vibrancy of our experience. Our experiences have lost their definition. Life's become bland or boring. It's like there's a generation of Christians who've been taught that in, in church, you eat, you, you eat plain white rice, but out there, there are succulent flavors. Meanwhile, God wants us to know that the whole world is His creation. It's beautiful. Are we allowed to be joyful as Christians without being considered superficial? Yes, did I cop flack when I allowed... What's the guitar legend's oak? What's his name? Yeah, Nathan. Call Nathan, do you want to come play? Oh, praise God, bro. I'd love to come be with your guys again. Yes, then I can start the phone call start. But this is a house of God and... How can you allow that stuff in you? And how can you allow the same people who play music in their cars on the way to and from work every day, who, to the best of my knowledge, they themselves are the house of God. To the last I knew. To the last I knew, this is a building. I thought you were the house of God. 
So, you know, just a thought. Just throw that out there. Are you allowed to be a Christian who can be sad and grieve without meaning you've lost your faith? Are you allowed to get angry without committing biblical sin? God is an expressive God. And He wants us to become an expressive people. So, number one, the God who delights. Let's talk about God's self-revelation, the God you think you know. Do you know that God delights to delight? He loves to be happy. The first chapter of Genesis, I'm on a banging on about that in the mornings at the moment. He delights in what he does. After every day of creation, particularly after the day he made mankind in his own image, God declares in Genesis 131, God saw that he had made and it was very good. God declares it was good. God delighted in his creation. God, our God, experiences intense feelings of happiness. See, some of us believe God is an, is an austere being out there who is stoic and he's got this gray beard and he's always got a frown. I mean, if he's old with a gray beard and a frown, it means he's getting old. What happens when he dies? Hey, have you ever thought about that? Those of you who think because he's the ancient of days, he's really getting old. God doesn't have a sense of humor. Well, how old do you get before you die? I don't know. But why is it that when God says in the book of Hebrews that Jesus is the exact representation of the Father's being and He reveals Himself to us at around the age of 30 years old, do you not think God wants us to see the picture of a young God? 30-year-old, stand up. Anyone who's around 30, stand up quickly. <laughs> quickly, look around you. You see these people? Face of God. Thank you. You can sit down. Right there. That's the face of God. He wants us to imagine Him as a 30-year-old. The face of God. Who delights. What delights God? God is delighted when He sees us acting in ways that honor Him. Well, How can I honor Him? Let me tell you what, the next time an older gray-haired person is standing in the coffee queue and you ask them to please go take a seat because you will take their place and order them a coffee so they can relax, you've just honored God. The next time you serve somebody older than you, the next time you care for someone younger than you, you've honored God. God is delighted when He receives our worship. You see, God doesn't trip on our worship. God doesn't need our worship. God doesn't have issues. He didn't create angels and say, no one's loving me. So I'm going to create these beings and they're all just going to love me. God delights when we worship him. He delights when we put him in a great place. We were in worship now now and all three of my sons, we had a function that all three were going to. All three bash bushwhacked me at the 10 o'clock meeting and all three made plans to go with other people. And they did. They went out after 10 o'clock meeting. First time I saw my kids, was now at church. If they used to have said hello to me. They, 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 hi boy. They come and my kids just don't even, you know, my little one ran up to me like this and just gave me, jumped into my arms and gave me a hug. I delighted in my son's attention. I delighted my boy listening to me preach now. I delight when my boys listen to me. God delights when you want to choose to give him your worship. When you choose to forget about yourself and focus on Him. God delights, I don't understand this one, but God is delighted when He sees faith demonstrated in the most trying circumstances. When you're holding on by the skin of your teeth and you don't know if you can make it through tomorrow, but you say, I trust you, He delights in your ability to trust in Him when there's nothing left. Can I tell you what else God delights in? He delights when he sees tender love shared among his own people. When we as Christians actually choose to love each other. And remember, love is an, uh, uh, is an, other way, an otherwise action. It's not received, it's given. Isn't it? Remember, God so loved the world that he gave. Not he loved, so loved the world that he received. 
It's that he gave. He delights when there's a tender love. A tender love means I'm able to express of myself to you for your benefit, even if I don't reap anything out of it. God says I delight in that. Yeah, I can't love this person anymore. Why? Because they've stopped loving me. Now I'm going to go and love them with his love. He delights. Do you know the Bible actually says, when I first read this many, many years ago, I couldn't get my head around it. God so delights over us that he sings over us. Zephaniah, the prophet, Zephaniah, chapter 3, verse 17. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. The Amplified says, The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who saves. He will rejoice over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. What does that mean? Making no mention of your past sins. In his love, he will be quiet about your past. But he will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. Quiet about your sin, loud about his delight in you. It's almost like God can't literally help but break into song. Please remember, this happens in the view of the angels, the hosts of heaven. They're all looking at him in adoration, and he comes to you, and there are moments in your life he can't help it. He just sings over you. What wonders to me is how you and I don't ever hear the song of God. But it's there. And you can be in the best place, Praise Mountain. You can be on Grumble Copy. And his song over you will sound. Heaven hears his song over you. You want to know something about how he delights? Let's look at Jesus. Who is the exact representation or the mirror of the image of God the Father. Jesus says in John 5, 19. Jesus says, very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son does also. Jesus was the perfect reflection of God's nature in every situation he encountered here on earth. What, what, where do we see that? What, what are we looking at where Jesus is the perfect reflection of God's nature? The wedding at Cana. First miracle Jesus ever does. He goes and arrives at a wedding where there is no more wine. There is no more joy. And he delights to turn water into wine that the party can continue because Jesus loves joy. He delights. John chapter 15 verse 9 says, Jesus says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands, and I remain in His love. I have told you this, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other like I've loved you. Verse 11 there in the Amplified says, I have told you these things so that my, my joy and my delight may be in you and that your joy may be full and complete and overflowing. Jesus is coaching us how to live in joy. He says, listen to my Father, keep His commands, and when you do that, I'm going to send joy and completeness your way. You want to start reclaiming some of the joy that's been lost? Start keeping his command. So he's the God who delights. He delights in you and he wants to share his delight or his joy with you. But he's not only a God who delights, he's a God who does sadness. God knows how to be sad. In the story of Genesis, uh, uh, Lazarus in John 11, when Jesus walked to the, to the tomb, he didn't put on a brave face, he wept. When he looked out over Jerusalem and he saw people wandering like sheep without a shepherd, and they were lost and wandering in their sins, he wept over Jerusalem. He longed for it. He says, I long to hold you like a mother hen watches over her chicks. I long to look out for you. It's amazing that Jesus had an incredible longing for the city that would kill him. 
Think of the, of the gut-wrenching agony of the night of his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. Matthew chapter 26, verse 37. Jesus took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here, keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, but not as, you, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus knew sorrow. He understood pain. He understood sadness. You see, Jesus traveled regions of sadness that many of us can identify with. Jesus knew betrayal. Jesus experienced desertion. He tasted denial. Yet not once was he anything but real. Nobody makes it through this life without taking a few hits. And I'm not talking about a couple of little shoulder punches. I'm talking about the punch to the gut that makes you wonder if you'll ever breathe again. God is able to feel our pain and our sadness, to identify with it deeply and sorrowfully. Whenever you're feeling sad, you need to know your God identifies with your sadness. Can I say this? When you're sad, he's sad with you. At the tomb of Lazarus, at the lostness of Jerusalem, at the pain of the anguish of the night of his crucifixion, before his crucifixion, Jesus knew sadness. And God is telling us, I'm able to be delightful and exuberant. I'm able to be sad. Thirdly, God does anger. I mean, we like the idea of a God that experiences joy. I even like the idea that God could be sad with me. But the fact that he gets angry, now that's scary. Eh? What are the kind of things that make God angry? Remember how Jesus entered the temple and he saw the money changers? Robbing people in a house of worship. In the Gentile court, where those who are trying to get in to pray, because... What they, they wouldn't go into the area where the Jewish men go. They wouldn't go there. So they went into the Gentile court and started to sell the pigeons and the goats and the sheep and the cows that would be sold for sacrifice. And they were extorting prices and doing all sorts of things. And the Bible describes how it says Jesus went to the temple. He walked around and he looked. Saw what was going on. And it says, and he went back to, to, to Bethpage, I think it was. And he goes back. And that night he makes himself a whip. He's thinking about this in his anger. He makes himself and fashions a very nice whip and comes back the next day and starts to use that whip. Now, I want to tell you, he's got to be pretty effective with that whip that the money changers leave their tables and run away. Because when you get someone to leave his money and run away who's a greedy person, you've got to know he's about to taste a whip. Jesus knows how to do anger. He chose his actions very carefully. These oaks had the choice, clear out of God's house or face the whip they ran. But thankfully, God's wrath, God's anger can be defined. This is what the Bible says in Psalm 103, verse 7. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger. That's the definition of God's anger. Slow to anger. Slow to anger. Abounding. In love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He doesn't treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed his transgressions from us. The message Bible puts it like this from verse 8. God is sheer mercy and grace. He is not easily angered. He is rich in love. He doesn't endlessly nag and scold, nor hold grudges forever. He doesn't treat us as our sins deserve, nor pay us back in full for our wrongs. As high as the heaven is over the earth, so strong is his love to those who fear him. And as far as sunrise is from sunset, he has separated us from our sins. You see, the Bible doesn't say God never gets angry. It says he's slow to angry. God holds back his wrath. He holds back his anger until we push him and push him and push him and push him until finally he responds. God's fundamental inclination toward us is loving kindness. That's his starting point toward us. He loves us. So here's the question. How do we get God angry? By deliberately, not, uh, by deliberately choosing not to accept what he did on the cross for us. 
Because when we choose not to accept the finished work of the cross, then, because we don't deal with that sin in our lives, all the other sins are able to stick. Do you understand? So if I can't, for instance, if I can't receive his forgiveness, well then when you blow it with me, I'm not forgiving you either. If I can't receive his healing, I can't treat you well. Because as we've said, hurt people hurt. Broken people break. Rejected people reject. But healed people heal. Loved people love. Forgiven people forgive. So if I can go to the cross and I can accept the finished work of Jesus, I can release. But if I go to the cross and I cannot accept that work, then whatever other sins I commit stick to me. And when they stick to me, they affect my actions. Jesus, want, God, wants to be and can be the most loving friend and companion you could ever want. But if you, if you have an attitude of rejection toward Jesus, you will find God to be the most fearful enemy you'll ever have for eternity. There are people who have nothing to look forward to except the ter terrible punishment of God's anger. God's anger is always legitimate. But here's what's amazing. At the exact same time, God's wrath subsides in a heartbeat when a stubborn person humbles himself and recognizes his sinful condition. The guy the, on, on the cross on the one side of Jesus, remember the Bible says that both of them, both those men, heaped abuse on him. And then at one point in time, one of them repented. Something happened in his heart on the cross. He turned to Jesus and all he could say was, remember me. That's all he could say. Couldn't pray the sinner's prayer. He couldn't go into that room over there. He's on a cross. Just said, remember me. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. The incredible eternal wrath of God aimed straight at that man. In one second was abated. That's how easy it is to escape the wrath of God. So God does angry. But fourthly, lastly, and I love this. God does gentleness. God does gentleness. At God's core is an intrinsic gentleness that wants to bear our burdens. Isaiah 42 verse 3. There's actually a whole book written about this. Where I tried to read it, but it's in Old English, so I struggled a bit. Written a couple hundred years ago. But Isaiah 42 verse 3. It says, a bruised reed he will not break. And a smoldering wick he won't snuff out. The Message Bible puts it like this. He won't brush aside the bruised and the hurt. And he won't disregard the small and the insignificant. But he'll steadily and firmly set things right. So Isaiah, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, chooses two very fragile things. A reed that's hollow, that bends in the wind and can break. And a wick, you know, a wick from an old lamp. That's just stuttering, spluttering with its last few little bits trying to keep a little bit of fire going. Where it seems one wrong move is going to see the reed break and the wick snuffed out. But God comes in. And I love this. He sees the fragility of his own people. There's something the Bible seems to indicate that attracts the care of God is when we're fragile. It's like when we're fragile, his eyes are upon us. When he finds a bruised reed or a, what, a what wick? A smoldering wick. It seems to attract him. And, and in his own way, and I underlined that in orange in my notes, because his ways are not our ways. But in his own way, he reaches out with an almost impossibly gentle touch. And he caresses the reed. And he brings new life to the dying flame. God has an incredible way of being gentle to us when we need him the most. So as I say, there's something about us that attracts the tenderness of our Father. You find it in the life of Jesus. I mean, we all know how testing little children can be. 
That's not a little child, he's 11. <laughs> At the end of a long, hard, busy day, and you get home from work, and all that little child wants is your attention. And so the crowds come, the mothers bring their children to Jesus so that he can bless them. And Jesus is hectically involved in ministry. What do the disciples do? Try and keep them away. What does Jesus do? Bring them. So the disciples try and chase these little ones away. And what does Jesus do? He says, bring them to me. So he cares for the little ones. Listen now. He even has a heart to care for the little ones who add no value to his ministry. They add no value to what he's doing. There's a second crowd that astounds me, the lepers. You know, when you were a leper, hey, obviously, you know, if you entered a city, you had to shout the words, unclean, unclean. Because leprosy was contagious. And so some of those people would become lepers as little kids. Some would have become lepers a little bit older. But some of those people wouldn't have experienced the touch or the hug or the embrace of a parent or a sibling or a child for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And all they have to do when they go near any other human being is shout, unclean, unclean. And the crowd parts because no one can go near a leper. What does Jesus do when he sees them? He communicates, he associates with, he heals, maybe even touches and lays hands on them. Looks through the horror of the moment and extends his gentleness towards them, restoring their dignity and in the cases in scripture, restoring their health. Ostracized from families, how did those souls feel when Jesus wrapped his arms around them? Where are we going with that? God has a gentle side that you and I are often very unfamiliar with. And we don't know how to access his gentleness. You see, some of us in human life only experience harshness, judgment, derision, and ridicule. And so we don't understand that God has a soft side. I mean, it tickles me that Luke's come in and out now and done this and that and David, my boy, is sitting over there. But here's the thing. If my children were scared of me and fearful of me, they'd never do this. They only do it because they know that daddy's their safest place. And now I want to ask you, is your relationship with God such that he's your safest place? Hey? Do you know how to access his kindness? I have had to every day, for six weeks, I've had to access, well, actually for 22 months, I've had to access the gentleness of my God every day. And he wants to. Point five, I finish. He allows us to stir it up. We can personally stir emotions within God. I don't understand how this works, but God allows himself to be moved by our responses to him. For good or for bad. Commented on it this morning. You know the Bible says in Galatians chapter 5 verse 22. That the gifts of the, uh, the fruit of the spirit is what? Help me. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness. What's the last one? What? That is so interesting. It is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. One of the fruits, the attributes of the character of God, listen, is his ability to control himself. He can control himself whilst allowing you and I to influence him in his emotions. Now that's interesting. We can make him joyful. When we respond in openness, in trust, in faith, in obedience to Him. When we resort to worship. When we think about Him and reflect on Him and do something we know would please Him. We can delight His heart. It's like this. I mean, you hear what I'm saying. But God's day can change. By your ability to delight Him through your actions. But He also enables you. To be able to break his heart. You see, he wants 
a passionate, willful, and fully emotional relationship with you and I. That's what the Bible says. Eye hasn't seen, nor has ear heard, nor can mind comprehend all that God has for us. But by the Holy Spirit, we're able to. Because do you understand that when you get to heaven, your emotional your whole emotional being is literally going to explode at the goodness of God. Psalm 148 says, praise the Lord. He made you with an ability for your breath to be taken away by some of the beautiful things he's put in creation. Do you notice how the old Christians made entire buildings to glorify God? Paintings. I mean, how many of us have been to the Sistine Chapel? I've been a couple of times. You get a sore head, obviously, your, your neck, you know, because you're not allowed to lie down. I did, but then they say, you know, mm, mm, mm. but I did. It's worth it. You're only going to get there once. There's all those signs that say, don't take pictures and keep standing upright. I just pretend I don't read in Italian. So you just lie down on the ground and you look and you look at what Michelangelo did. You think, uh, the, the, whoa. years and years and years on a scaffold, entire edifices done to the glory of God. You can't call it idolatry because the temple was the same. It was made beautiful to the glory of God. Architecture, uh, artistry, pottery. There are things put out there. The glory of the stars, just a simple little flower, a, 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 a butterfly. God looks, he puts this thing out for us to think, wow. And what happens when we see him one day who is the full expression of love? He wants an emotional relationship with you. Yet it gives us the ability to break his heart. Because in Christianity, you don't ever just break rules. You break God's heart. We don't just step out of line. We violate relationship. We don't just disobey. We, we dishonor our closest friend. We don't just mess up. We push away the hands that were scarred to save us. We can arouse God's anger. How do we arouse God's anger? By pushing Jesus away. By getting stubborn. By going our own way. But also, we can attract God's tenderness. By crying out to Him. By honestly presenting ourselves before Him. Every one of our actions and attitudes affects our Father. He's an expressive God. And He's enabled us to stir His heart. I want to conclude by saying this. One massive implication of loving and expressive God is that we are rescued from an expressionless existence. Now, I'm going to be very careful what I say now. But because I'm going through grief share at the moment, and I'm seeing a grief counselor, so depending on how my diary works, I can get double whammy in the same week. But I want to say this. They teach... That when you hold on to certain emotions and don't let them go, you get stuck in that area of your life. And then because you can't cope, you medicate. And then when you medicate, you keep yourself safe because you can't feel. The problem with not feeling is you're not feeling. Then you'll never know true joy again because you live in a passive place where you can't express. Now, I said I say this carefully because I'm not talking about someone whom a doctor prescribes medication to because your emotions are all over the place. I'm not talking about you. You need to be wise. I'm talking about where I'm at, where I, my times later at night are my lonely times. When my boys are asleep and you just lie there and your mind wanders and you can't, you've got to go to a place where you allow yourself to feel and to express, because otherwise you go to an expressionless place, you close yourself off, and the problem is you and everyone around you becomes losers. God has rescued us from an expressionless existence. He sent the Holy Spirit to transform us as His image bearers that we can express like He does. Some of us honestly have lost the intensity of our emotion. We've toned down, and God wants to restore the capacity for expressiveness. Can I say this? We need to allow ourselves under God, I'm almost done, to experience intense and extended delight. Intense and extended delight. Number one, in worship. We have the privilege of having a great team who love to worship the Lord. 
we should actually give ourselves to Him in worship. In nature. You know that old saying, go smell the roses. Go do a bit more than that. Go and look out on this incredible creation we have. Some of us need to experience intense and extended delight in relationships. Some of us have cut ourselves off from relationships because of our fear of being hurt. Because we've been hurt before. But love isn't about what I get, it's about what I give. Because you delight yourself in how you give towards others. Is that right? And listen, I understand some of you here tonight can have been in a place where you've been very hurt. Talking to this uh, blonde lady, she's, uh, um, she's my son's, my, all three boys are seeing psychologists at their school to help them through what's just happened with us. And my middle son's psychologist, they've got different psychologists, she had a meeting with me the other day, a very nice, beautiful blonde girl. And I'm having a chat with her, and she says to me, and, and I, I won't tell your name because it's been recorded, but she said to me, now Greg, one thing about your grief, she said, not only did you know for 19 months that this was coming, but... And I'm not being disrespectful. It's neat. It's clean. Because it's cut. It's neat. She said, I myself have been divorced for two and a half years. I still fight with my ex-husband over custody and over finances. She said, that's jagged. Because I've still got to deal with that thing. She said, so in your case, you can be grateful that it's it's neat. There's nothing you can do about it. I have to go back as a psychologist and go and face this thing every single day. So I understand that there are people who go through different kinds of difficulty. But I want to remind you that God still wants to rescue you and bring you to a place where expressively you can feel the love and the joy and the peace and the extended privilege of relationships and friendships again. Where you open yourself up again. Because yes, you have been hurt, but your future doesn't have to be defined by that. But you've got to make choices. Can I almost say this? Now, please hear what I'm saying, not what I'm not saying. There needs to be more dancing. There needs to be more parties. Now, some of you, I'm not saying you go and phone your friends and get a bottle of tequila. I'm not. <laughs> Greg said, Greg didn't say. But can I also say to the band, we need some more praise songs. Not just slow stuff. I want to sweat again. So hear me, guys. We need to dance. We need to praise the Lord again. We need to have some stage jumping. We need to, we need to dance again. We need joy in the house. But there needs to be more dancing, more parties. But parties, I don't mean those parties. I mean where we as friends can get together, put good music on, and just enjoy each other. More laughter, more fun, with the increased presence of the Holy Spirit. On Friday night, we went and celebrated one of my best friend's birthdays. And we, we, we are, we're a group of people that unfortunately are called the groupies, but it's, they mean well. I don't know why it's, it's a bad name, but we're called that. And we're always on someone's birthday or someone's special celebration, the couples go out together. And Friday night was my first time I went out with them, but I was alone. And we went to Salsa at Bedford View. And there's all these young 20s and 30s. And they're having the time of their lives. And they're celebrating and they're partying. And the one guy at our table thinks he's very funny. He said to me, Greg, just think, look at all these tables. He said, you can legally now go sit at any of those tables and pick up any of those. <laughs> but what was good for me, even though it was sad, what was good for me was to be with my best friends. Some of them, because some of you are like, well, I wasn't there. Like, uh, some of <laughs> And it was so good just to be with people who bring me joy when I need it. That's what I mean by more fun, more laughter, more parties, more Christians just enjoying one another in the increasing manifest presence of the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, if you want to start expressing again, 
some of us need to experience a bit of sorrow. The deep, heart-wrenching sorrow with no pretending so that you can go through it and come out the other end. That's why Julius and Joe, they won't hold at the moment, but Jules said to me with a grief share, he said, Greg, wait a month and then start going through it. People pull out of that course because it's hard. But Jules, is, he did the first week with me. Maureen's working with me. She did the second week. She'll do the third one with me on, on Tuesday morning. You go through these things and you feel intense sorrow so that the, the pain can turn into celebration of a life well lived later on. Because if not, we can never look at photos again. We can never talk again. It becomes something we know we don't go there. Ask David. He's standing right there. We talk about mommy every day. Mommy's photos are staying up on the walls. They're never going to go away. Even if I should remarry. Those photos are staying on the wall because I spent a quarter of a century with that girl. Do you understand? But if I don't, if I don't deal with it, it stays hidden. And if you don't deal, excuse my expression, if you don't deal with your stuff, you're going to keep it hidden. And some of you need the courage to decide, I'm going to go through a little bit of sorrow and mourning so that joy can come in the morning. Some of us need to express appropriate anger. What do I mean? Some of us need to get angry about oppression, injustice, discrimination, the position of the poor. And we need to act. Can I say this? Lastly, some of us in this room need to start doing gentleness and tenderness. Some of us are robbing our children, our friendships, and our marriages of real emotion because we refuse to just be real. We refuse to be tender. We refuse to be gentle. We put these high walls up and we protect ourselves and we're strong, but you're not. You're hurting. And some of us need to say, God help me to start feeling again. Honestly, some of us throwing scriptures out every 15 seconds we're not real enough. We're too fake. And fake carries no anointing. Fake carries no reality. We have an expressive God who has explored depths of emotion and feeling that is beyond the realm of human understanding. But has invited us to an entire eternity of getting to know him better. Stand with me, please.